Anyway, uh, my name is Victor. I work as a product owner focusing on extending the features of the Vitim platform towards full stack teams where there is clear preference for front end development with TypeScript and using the NPM ecosystem. And starting off today with the topic of reactive templates, TypeScript, and typed endpoints in Vitim. Uh, first, the question is why do I stress the reactive? reactive approach to UI, why to make this distinction and con contrast reactive to whatever the other approach is. Uh, the core reason I believe is that it's the best approach we currently know for building UIs. And that might or might not be the case. You might be wondering, is that really so? Luckily, we have some data and Stack Overflow runs yearly development surveys. Uh, for instance, thanks to them, we know that in practice, if we think of the world of web development uh, today, still jQuery is number one most used web library or web framework. And this is about as far as I can get from a uh, reactive UI approach. But uh, the runner apps together, which are reactive, would actually um, help balance that. But still, uh, even if reactive is so good, it's apparently not the major, the top most used framework at, as of today. But is that what we actually want to use as developers? Uh, turns out that not quite. Even though jQuery is the most widely used, about two thirds of the developers who use it today actually dread using it. It's not something people actually want to use. So what do people want to use? The answer is actually all three top uh, most popular frameworks are centered around the reactive approach to building UIs. And so the conclusion I could draw from that data, from that picture is that reactive UI is clearly dominating the space, if not currently maybe yet, but Certainly, this is what we are looking to have in the future. So a few years from now, I believe the data would show that uh, in most projects, the web UIs are built using one of the reactive approaches to the UI. That's why uh, it is important to draw that distinction. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we at Valin also want to make sure that this approach is, is comfortable and is working really well when building web UIs for Java backends with Valin. Uh, speaking of that approach to what is uh, very short or very briefly, what is the core concept of that? If I try to simplify a lot, the concept is actually not that difficult to grasp. It's when you try to express UI in some sort of declarative manner, uh, taking state clearly explicitly separate and making the UI function of the state a render function. And you would probably want to have some templating language uh, that your render function works with, which would most likely resemble HTML. And in many cases, that's exactly how it works. Why is that uh, important? One aspect of it is that with reactive approach, you actually see uh, all states of the UI, all variations of the UI in one place, and they just depend on state of the application or state of the UI. Whereas with the imperative approach, what you end up having is you define the initial state somewhere, perhaps in HTML, and then uh, you add the imperative logic to react on events here and there. And this logic would typically just directly modify the state of the UI. And if you have several pieces of logic, if your UI is highly dynamic, chances are you would forget to change some parts here, some part there, and that's why it's difficult to grow. I believe this is probably one of the core reasons for the popularity of so many re reactive approaches. So with that out of the way, you could ask maybe, okay, how do I use reactive UI approach? How do I create a reactive template to a widen application? And before going into that, I uh, would like to highlight several key choices, architectural level choices that you would need to take when you have a Java backend and you're adding a reactive UI to it. 
And maybe most obvious choice is about what library or what framework you use for a reactive DOM rendering. And this is where uh, maybe this is the first question that comes to mind, because we all know the most Maybe the most popular is React, and the runner-ups are there. So you could start arguing which of them to choose. But that's not the only choice, really, to think about when adding to a Java application something reactive for the web. Uh, naturally, from rendering flows a question of what do you use to manage the state, since reactive UIs means the state is explicitly separate. In many cases, you might want to settle on a set of conventions or maybe choose a library to manage your state that define how to work with it. And there are several options to choose from there. And I would say that this is also impacting the architecture of the application. So it's important to have an understanding of what you're signing up for. And apart from the technicalities of the DOM rendering state management, very interesting question that also has a lot to do with uh, adding web UIs is about how you structure the project and interestingly enough, that also implies how you structure the team or teams working on the project. If you have Java on your backend, if you're adding web, would you do it in a separate repo, separate team, and then have the communication boundaries between? Or would you do it so that it's a full stack team working on a full stack project together? So some choices to be made there. And finally, talking about the API, if you have something running in the browser on the client side, and then you have your Java backend running on the server, you need to have communication handled for you. And there are several options how to do it. And it's also an architectural choice to make. And Widen takes, uh, makes the choices for you. Uh, certainly, we make a decision. But I would like to iterate a little bit on uh, the reasoning there so that it's maybe a little bit more clear once you start building this with, with Widen. It, it's maybe easier to understand why the decision was made. Uh, the way it was. The first one here is about reactive template rendering. And the obvious question here, is first that comes to mind, do we use React? Do we use maybe Angular? Do we use Do you? Do we use something else? Uh, and this is a very heated area where uh, many, uh, several popular frameworks have huge supportive communities and highly polar opinions there. It's difficult to look through the uh, the hype, so to say, and really understand the dimensions and how these different options compare with each other. And uh, from my perspective, uh, the, maybe the two dimensions to look for here are the approach to DOM manipulation. Is it about virtual DOM model that is then later synced up with the DOM in the browser versus uh, you keep uh, cha incremental changes to the DOM directly? or the bet on browser standards versus a bet on the library itself. And this is where we see, or I outline the options here. Uh, React is clearly something that uses virtual DOM and has a very large community. It's popular, but it's not really built on top of the browser standards, it's not using web components, and not, it's not using template literals. Instead, it introduces uh, GSX, a custom syntax, so which implies custom build tool, would typically be needed to create these templates and uh, yeah, add them to your application. Uh, Vue.js also uses virtual DOM similar to React. Uh, also has large community, not as large, but also very, very big. It's similarly not using browser standards. So in, in those two dimensional aspects, I would say Vue and React are kind of similar. Of course, they differ in other aspects, but the, the two I chose, they are not too different. Angular, on the other hand, doesn't use virtual DOM. It uses direct DOM manipulation internally. It uses a complicated uh, or complex, rather, uh, template compilers that produce optimized code that directly manipulate the DOM based on uh, state changes. But still, it doesn't use too much, uh, doesn't use the web component standard, doesn't use the uh, standards like tag template literals. Rather, it builds upon the features that are added inside Angular framework. And, and the opposite to all of that, we have uh, smaller libraries like lead HTML or lead element that try to delegate to the browser as much as possible and would only uh, add something that is not available as a standard feature. So using 
direct DOM manipulation, not very really virtual DOM, using te type template literals and incremental updates to the DOM and using web components as the format for, for UI, uh, reusable UI components is something that Lead Element and Leash HTML are uh, focused on. And that's the choice we are making here explicitly to high uh, to bet on the browser on the browsers rather than on any particular framework. And the main reason for that is being able to provide long-term support, which we offer with Widen, which is five years for uh, for free, and then possibly ten more years for commercial extended support. And that is a commitment that is really difficult to make if we are building on top or recommending using. A library that we have really little control over, whereas with browser standards is a feasible choice. Doesn't mean that the other alternatives here are not really uh, working, but it's not something we would officially support. Now, the reactive state management uh, is another aspect here, and we have the choices, uh, several choices, and maybe the main prim primary dimension to compare those would be the implicit versus explicit. Very popular frameworks. Uh, they differ maybe not so much in terms of the capabilities or features, but rather just the approach. With re Redux, you'll get something that is maybe somewhat verbose, but it's very explicit. It's very clear what happens. And the accent or focus is put on the functional uh, style of programming. It's purely functional. It's really working well with this functional style of programming with React, uh, but maybe not so well when we think of class-based components. Still can work, no problem, but just feels more natural to use with functional uh, applications, functional style applications. MobX is less verbose, more implicit, relies on conventions and defaults. Arguably, that works a little bit better for class-based component systems since it allows work. It allows working with the state, making it observable in a similar fashion as working with just regular class methods and properties. But functionally equivalent, I would I would say to the other alternatives. The question more of an implicit versus explicit per, per preference. And AngioRx is something built using observable streams and works really well. Essentially, also allows you to work with state. Um, have all the same functionality eventually, but uh, write a little bit different code. It works well when the whole application is built around the concept of observable streams, but when you don't have those yet, just introducing uh, this single library for managing state might be a little bit of a question choice. Uh, the thing, I, uh, the choice I want to highlight in this demo would be around MobX, but that's in no way an excluding other alternatives. It's just that if we have to recommend something, we'd recommend this. But if you want to try out an experiment, um, go ahead. Uh, the team and project composition is something uh, really uh, interesting. I haven't heard that being discussed a lot in the other contexts yet. I believe that's that's an important one to to be conscious about when choosing a library. When you have your backend in Java and you have you're building a front end, do you want to organize a different team, a different repo for that? Or do you want to be working in a full stack team where maybe two different people would work on front and back end, or maybe you'll have full stack developers where everybody works both sides, depending on the need of today. Um, so the options here, basically two options. You could either separate completely, a separate create a separate repo, separate project, build a UI using one of the frameworks and then uh, communicate with your backend over some sort of an API, which you maintain. You'll end up having two teams, most likely. Uh, you'll end up having an API in between, which is a good thing if you have several clients using the same API, but which could be an overhead if you uh, only build single backend and a single client. And in that situation, you might not need to spend extra effort on defining the API. And this is what you can avoid by creating a project that contains both parts together and allows you to call your backend uh, without having to define too much of explicit API contract in between. And that's what brings us to the final point here that I want to consider is the way you access your API from your client-side uh, UI code. Uh, 
there's several options here and the dimension I would choose to compare them on is how high or how low level would that be? Is that the network level protocol or is it an application level protocol? Maybe the most, maybe the most popular here would be REST, RESTful endpoints is something many people are familiar with. It's very easy. You can add those with say Spring, Spring uh, MVC. No problem. Uh, the downside is maybe that you have to uh, basically work with the HTTP requests unless you use another helper library that help uh, that helps with that. And if you want to use TypeScript and types, then you'll end up defining these types in Java on, one, on, on the one hand and in TypeScript on the other hand. And that's maybe a boilerplate, but still very popular and widely used. gRPC is maybe Another option less widely used, but also viable, especially if you have more of a stream type of communication. Still low level because you'll need to have some helper library to be able to use it efficiently. And finally, GraphQL, maybe a rising in popularity option, allows you or gives a lot of control in the hands of front end developer teams essentially gives the same level of access to the database as S SQL SQL gives gives you but it's, it's super flexible so some some people some teams might want to use it but then it also puts uh, extra burden on the backend team to provide this uh, kind of powerful graphql endpoint and some people would not want to give to free to uh, unrestricted access to the data to the database you would what might want to introduce more controls and in that case it would be a little bit different difficult to do with graphql and then you could choose to use something a bit more higher level and that's what Vadin typed endpoints would give you which are sort of a layer built on top of restful apis but it includes uh, type information so that calling an API endpoint from TypeScript looks and feels very similar to calling just an asynchronous TypeScript function with type information given to you both for return types and return values and the parameter types. And that's obviously the choice that we would promote here to make sure that communication could happen uh, seamlessly and the security would be taken into account just by default. So Wadin, Wadin has these choices done for you. Doesn't mean that it's the only sane set of choices. Basically on every dimension, you could do another choice, but uh, you'll end up having a bit different trade-offs. So this set of trade-offs that we have here is what Wadin support for TypeScript development offers. We call, uh, it's an extension to the Wadin framework, Wadin flow framework that works for Java developers and allows creating UIs using the Java APIs. Uh, now, this is an extension that allows adding reactive uh, template-based APIs using TypeScript endpoints. And it can coexist very well in the same application or the entire application could be built with just, uh, just that. Uh, now, maybe that was enough talking and uh, an interesting point here would be to start looking at the source code. Some examples of the features and functionality that I mentioned. At this point, uh, I'd like to maybe advertise a little bit the uh, the project that we have, the Start Wadding.com. It's a service uh, or online kind of application builder. It is arguably the easiest way to get started and try an application with Wadin. Uh, for the purpose of this demo, I would show how to, I might modify an application that I uh, that resembles very much the one that you get from from this service. It works in a way that if you want to try the reactive UI approach here with reactive templates and endpoints, you will need to change the settings uh, of the entire application and choose the approach to the UI that you want. And reactive UI would, would be TypeScript and HTML. That would require you using the latest version, but in 15 on year, that is one in 17 of today, or you can get a preview with wide in 18 already. And then uh, you add the views. Uh, with every view, you can still decide if you want to 
build it with TypeScript or with Java, but for the purpose of this demo, all the views would stay the default that I chose for the application. Once I am happy with the views, I would download and I would encourage you later after the talk, try this out and um, get something running for yourself. Now, in uh, this my application that I'm showing now, uh, I've already downloaded and I run an application here. I did some changes, so it's not identical to the one that you get from the from the service uh, right away, but it still has a list view or it has a login in addition to what you get uh, from start loading com. But it has the same list view. Oh, my password password is not very strong according to Google Chrome. Uh, list view and a dashboard view. In addition to what you get uh, in default, this one also, I've added the search field and the add contact form here. Now, how does the source code for that application look like? Let's see, I have it here on the left side of the screen. And uh, for this form, for instance, I would look at something called contact form. And it's a custom element, which is created in TypeScript and lives in the same project now with the Java code. Remember, we talk about the project structure. So here, all the entire UI lives in the front end folder here. It has all the TypeScript and CSS and whatever resources you need uh, alongside the typical SRC main Java and so on structure of a Maven project. And so it's single repo, single deploy, deployable artifact, and a single team could work on every part of that project. Now the contact form here is defined using in declarative fashion using syntax that resembles HTML a lot and uses HTML tagged literal. So it's based on uh, this is standard browser feature which does not require transpilation, uh, unlike GSX syntax, but uh, it still looks very, very similar. Uh, you might notice that I used things that part of the application state. So I bound uh, dynamic parts of that, that template using the curly brace notation like this. And that means that whenever um, something changes here, the template would be updated uh, accordingly. Let's take a closer look at the button section here. That's the save, delete, and cancel. So you see that I have the disabled property on every button bound to uh, properties of the form binder. And the reactivity part here works in a way that if binder is dirty, then the, the form wouldn't be, the button wouldn't be disabled. And I start typing here like, uh, okay, say Victor, that's my name. And you see that the button here immediately, okay, that now it gets disabled because of validation fails. Now again, enabled again. So this is the kind of reactivity that I'm talking about where when referring to, to, temp, to reactive templates. I don't have to define any special logic that tells that I need to change the state of a button. Rather, upfront when defining the UI, I, I say that the state the state of the button disabled or not depends on these set of properties. And whenever each or any of the property changes, the template gets re-rendered without me having to define extra or do extra manipulation with the UI. So that's one part. Now speaking speaking about state management, I have another view here. Let's say cancel this one. Uh, the view, the list view, that has the form. Can I? Do... So I can display side by side. And you can notice if I change something in the form, it gets updated in the list view immediately. In order to get this, I have the list view and it uses the data from, also uses the same approach. So it's uh, lit, uh, based on lit element, but in this case, it introduces mobx into the mix 
to manage the state. And I have the state of the application here and I use it inside my view. So the items here in the grid, here is dividing grid, I get the items from the state. And when something changes in the form, I update the content inside the state. And that's why when the form is saved, uh, save contact, I don't have to worry about uh, triggering any updates to the grid. I could just rely on that this template would react to this change of the state as long as the state is made in a way that things are connected. If I go to see what happens when the contact is safe, I see that at that point, the list of contacts gets updated and then we call the backend and then we ref uh, refresh the data from the backend. So as long as I modify the state as a reaction to the user event and my other view uses the same state, the same property, I don't have to worry about being explicit in calling that the grid should update when uh, my contact had changes. So that's about the state management part. And the part that I want to highlight last was about the API. So how do I call the backend here in this application? Here is the save contact method is triggering the call from TypeScript that runs in the browser into my Java code that runs on the server. How does that work? Let me try to see or find what is the Java code that gets called when I uh, okay, save contact. This is the Java code and this is the Java class. How can I... Um, do that how can i expose this kind of api to my uh, client side well one way would be to say that this is a rest controller and this would be a get or post mapping for saving and then i will have to do some deserialization of the request here and then i would save it to the database and return something back what we do here with vaden is uh, we have an endpoint annotation that uh, automatically does all of the above plus it generates the code uh, so that this method can be called from TypeScript as, a just, as just an asynchronous method, which is exactly what happens when I try doing save contact here. If I see what it is, it uh, on the top of the page here, I see that save contact is something that is imported from a service endpoint file that is generated for me. And if I try to see uh, what is the signature of that, method here, save contact, I actually see that it accepts an object with a type contact. It doesn't accept an untyped JSON or just anything. It only works with contacts. If I try to do something else, would complain. Now, what is a contact? It has a type. How does that, did I have to define this type in TypeScript? No, again, this is an auto-generated because it is used as part of the uh, endpoints in, in, endpoint interface. So I have it's enough to have that type in my Java code here. It can be a directly an entity. It could be a DTO object, that data transfer object. If I use it in my endpoint, uh, my TypeScript code can use the same type. And that's uh, the beauty of having both front-end code and back-end code in the same application and being able to run some smart code generation based on one to produce the other. When both code bases coexist closely close enough together, we can uh, unlock benefits like this. And I didn't spend too much time looking into the authentication part, but I could also say that uh, with using endpoints, the default is that uh, these endpoints are not available unless the user is actually logged in with the with the server which can, of course, be changed. But uh, the point here is that with REST is something that you need to take care about explicitly, whereas with, if you go one level higher and make and start building a, your APIs in terms of application on the application layer, that could be something that is just provided and taken for granted. Um, I think we could... Uh, this point switch to the questions part. I haven't been following.